Well, good morning, church. Welcome. We are glad you are with us this morning. My name is Rod. I'm one of the pastors here. And I just want to take a minute and speak to our Glendale campus. We are so excited you are with us this morning. Uh, many of you don't know, but last week was their kickoff in their building. It is all ready to go. Absolutely. They actually doubled in size last week, which is so awesome. And I just want to say, Glendale, I am so proud of you. I was down there last week with your trunk or treat, meeting people from your community, and I love the way that you are loving people in Glendale, Arizona. So keep up the good work. We're so excited to have them with us. Thank you, everybody who is here with me uh, in Las Vegas. Uh, let's get started. We're in a new series this morning called Every, uh, how, to, how to Be Rich. And I just want to tell you, everyone wants to get rich. I googled this week how to get rich. 1.8 billion results in like two seconds. The top 10 uh, consisted of some of these topics. Four steps anyone can take to get rich. Five smart and effective ways to get rich. A beginner's guide to getting rich. Seven secrets of a millionaire, how to get rich quick, and how to be rich at a young age. There are 450 books on Amazon when you search how to get rich. But if we're honest, we are all rich, right? By worldwide standards, you're richer than most people. 70% of the world lives on less than $10 a day. The question is not to how to get rich, it's what do you do when you find yourselves rich? Well, let's look at what Paul says this morning in 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 18. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. Okay, church, this is where we're going over the next three weeks. We're looking at what Paul says. He says, how to be rich? Well, he lays out three principles. We should be generous, we should serve one another, and we should love each other. This may seem easy, but it gets the more difficult, the richer we become. How come no one is rich, but we all know someone who's rich, right? We never feel rich. If I asked you if you're rich, you probably would say, no, I'm not rich, but I know people who are rich. Someday you may find yourself rich, and we want you to be good at it. And most people aren't good at being rich. Rich people give less than poor people, which is interesting. Uh, as you make more money, you may give more, but the percentage of your income that you give goes down. In America, if you make $50,000 a year, you give around 6% of your uh, wealth away to nonprofits and other things. And if you make 200,000, you give around 4%. So it's more money, but that percentage goes down. And we're gonna see in this series that Jesus isn't impressed with your dollars he wants your heart and someday if you ever become rich I want to help you do that well and so does God so let's jump into our series how to be rich have you ever thought what made Jesus angry and maybe you didn't know Jesus got angry maybe you grew up in a place where anger was toxic it was abusive it was scary. So you equate anger with pain. Well, we're going to see that Jesus did get angry, but it was different than how you and I get angry. When we get angry, we do stupid things. Amen, church? Yeah, everybody just mumbled. I get it. I can hear you all the way from Glendale. You're like, well, yeah, I get it, you know. We let small, unimportant things get us worked up. Do you remember last month when you were so angry? No, either do I. It's because we get worked up about little things. And if you're like me, you're like, why did I get so worked up around that, right? 
Why did that make me so angry? Was it worth it? Maybe it's why the first scripture I memorized was for, uh, James 1, 19 and 20, right? Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry, because man's anger does not produce the righteousness that God requires. In other words, there's nothing usually productive about my anger. And I learned early on as a parent that anger is a secondary emotion. Let me unpack this for a couple seconds. It's really interesting that usually we get angry in response to something, right? So when I say anger is a secondary emotion, my kids would make me angry. But it usually was because they were being knuckleheads in Walmart, throwing themselves down, and I was embarrassed. I thought people were looking at me. So my anger was actually the secondary emotion to be embarrassed, or, or maybe I don't get my way, or maybe I'm afraid of something, or, or I'm worried. If you're on TikTok and you watch the scare videos and somebody jumps out and scares somebody, what's the second emotion they feel? Anger, right? They start yelling at the person that scared them. Anger is a secondary emotion. Church, if we're honest, we want to control things. And we get angry when things don't go our way. So my question again is, what made Jesus angry? Well, I'm glad you asked. This morning we're going to look at it. Mark 3, 1 through 6. Feel free to open your Bible. Everything will be behind me. Uh, if you don't own a Bible, there is a Bible in front of you. You can take that, write your name in it. That is our gift to you. Uh, but let's jump into Mark 3, 1 through 6. Jesus went into the synagogue again and noticed a man with a deformed hand. Now, I'm not sure what's going on. Maybe this man was born with a deformed hand or it was an accident, but obviously his muscles had probably atrophied. I'm sure for him this was embarrassing. He probably wanted to keep it hidden. Verse 2 says, since it was the Sabbath... Jesus' enemy watched him closely. So I just want you to, you to hear this. Jesus is going to church. So the next time I run into you and you're like, well, I don't need church. It's just Jesus and me. I would tell you, Jesus is at church. Well, Rod, you know, my church is the desert or on a lake fishing or that's where I spend my time. And I'm like, that's great. But Jesus was in church, right? Right? Uh, there's a difference between knowing God and knowing there is a God. And that's a very small thing. But if you tell me, man, I don't really do church, uh, me and Jesus just get alone, I, I would say you know that there is a God, but do you know God? Romans 1, 19 tells us that, that and when we go outside, when you stand on the lip of the Grand Canyon, when you're up in... Uh, Utah somewhere, when you're maybe on the beach in California, you see the vastness, you see the glory of God, that there is, that we get to know that there is a God, but without Jesus, we do not know God. And so Jesus says, uh, in fact, we read in Acts 4.12 that under no other name is salvation granted yet that of Jesus. In other words, we can know there is a God, but if we don't say yes to Jesus who died on the cross, if, if we don't accept Jesus Christ into our heart, then we don't know God. And I believe one of the best places for you to know God is church. Getting around other people who know Jesus, following Jesus as they follow Jesus and doing that. So what, what I just find is interesting is every time it's a Sabbath, every time it, it's Saturday in Jewish culture, but every time it's a Sunday, you know where Jesus is? Church. You can say it. It's okay. You can speak in church. Jesus was in church. And there was a crowd gathered because Jesus was such a good teacher. Right? People always were intrigued by what he said. So they notice that Jesus sees this man, and they're waiting to see what he will do, right? If he heals the man's hand, they're going to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. Now, what's interesting is Jesus walks into church. Everybody sees that he notices this man, and everybody kind of catches their breath. They're all waiting to see what's going to happen. What's this Jesus guy going to do? And what we're going to see is Jesus knows exactly what's on their mind. Verse 3. Jesus said to the man with the deformed hand, come and stand in front of everyone. Then he turned to his critics and he asked, does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save a life or destroy it? 
This is an obvious question, one most people would answer. The Sabbath was supposed to be kept for non-work activities, but most of them had probably saved an animal on the Sabbath. My guess is if their ox went in a ditch that they would help them out, right? Something happened with their flock, they would take care of it on the Sabbath. They certainly would probably save the life of their kids or their family member on the Sabbath. Now, this question is getting to the heart of something important. And here's my first point I want to tell you. Uh, I want to ask this question. Is God's law made for the benefit of God or for the benefit of man? Do we just follow the law so that God is pleased? Or is God pleased when we want to follow the law? Just a subtle difference there. But it goes to intent. Jesus is asking the religious leader, the, the people who, whose whole life is dedicated to doing good, their, their whole job is to be ceremonially clean. They're supposed to know how to teach the, the Torah. They, they're supposed to know the answers to this question. And this should have been a slam dunk. Let me ask you the same question and see if it's as difficult for you as it was for them. What's better to do at church? Do you think it's better to save a life or to kill somebody when you come to church? You laugh. That's the question he's asking, right? It seems like, dude, that's such an easy question. But here's the next verse. They wouldn't answer him. The problem is they couldn't let him be right. They didn't want him to win. They were against Jesus. So no matter what, they were going to disagree with anything he said. Church, I need you to hear me on this next point. When my application of Scripture conflicts with the intent of Scripture, I have the wrong application. Let me say that again. When my application of Scripture conflicts with the intent of Scripture, I have the wrong application. God's Word is there to transform our life. Your life shouldn't transform the Word of God. In other words, when you read something that you don't like and your feelings get in the way, who wins? Your feelings or the Word of God? Now you may say, well, that's a slam dunk. Our society would say your feelings win. You feel like a different pronoun today? That's good. We're going to call you they and them. You feel offended? Well, I guess what I said, whether it was true or not, is violence against you, and you are offended. What I said was wrong. You feel like that's not a sin? Well, it's probably okay for you to do. You feel like you're righteous, treating other people poorly? I'm sure that's fine. You feel like God will understand you? I I'm sure he will. And you feel like God wants you to be happy? Well, I have no doubt that that is true. Jeremiah 17, 9 says something very important. It says, our heart is wicked. And I love in the NIV, it actually says, your heart is deceitful. So I need you to hear something. Your heart will deceive you. Feelings are not facts. Whatever you feel doesn't make it real, but your heart will always deceive you. So when you read scripture and you don't like it and your feelings tell you, that can't be the God I know, that's not right. Uh, my interpretation has got to be better than the word of God you have the wrong application. We are not listening to the word of God. Church, let's, let's be a people who read the word of God, whether we like it or not, that we follow the word of God. Amen? Amen. Okay, so how does Jesus respond when God's people use his word to hurt the people God loves? Right? That's the question. How does God respond when people use his word to try and destroy the people he loves? The next verse he looked around at them and anger at them angrily and was deeply saddened by their hard hearts. This word angrily is interpreted as wrath in other places. So if I were to ask you, what makes Jesus angry? Some of you would go, sin. Sin makes Jesus angry. Yes, sin does make Jesus angry, but sometimes it, it saddens him. But what's reserved for his wrath? or his indignation, as you may interpret it, these people, right? They knew the answer, but they wouldn't say it. They knew what was right, but they wouldn't do it. They knew he was correct, and they wouldn't admit it. He was angered and distressed by their pride. Beware when you start feeling too proud. Jesus' wrath was always for religious people who felt proud. 
Now, it wasn't that they were ignorant. Jesus, at times when people didn't know what they were doing, it says that his heart broke for them because they were like a sheep without a shepherd. He had compassion for people who didn't know better. But he got angry when people knew better and wouldn't do it anyway. Then Jesus says something amazing. He said to the man, hold out your hand. Put yourself in that man's shoes. What was he thinking? Right? This is the thing that I've kept hidden from people. It's probably the reason I can't work, or maybe the reason that he was going to lose his kids to a debtor because, because he had this deformed hand. It, it's the root of my shame. You don't want me to really do show and tell right now in front of the whole community about the thing that I'm most ashamed of. And it's really a small community, Jesus. Everybody probably knows, even if they haven't seen it, they know what's going on. You want me to show everybody? My guess is he knew who Jesus was. Maybe he had seen him healed before because he knew because he's going to follow Jesus' command. Have you ever been where this man is? Jesus is asking you to heal you. He's saying we need to bring things to the light. Now, I've used this uh, example before, but here's what I want you to think of. I want you to think of your life as being a motel, one of the old motels where these keys hang behind you in all the rooms, and, and you say yes to Jesus, and so Jesus comes into your life, he resides in your heart, and he, he comes up to the desk where you're going, and he says, uh, I, I want to see into your room, and you're like, Jesus, the best room to go in is the green room. You go into the green room. I've got it cleaned up. This is the room where I used to drink and smoke and do all those vile things. But, man, I've had victory over those for years. So here is, you, you just go into this room, and, and it's great because you're going to see how good things are. And Jesus goes, that's great. I'll check that out later. But I want, I want to go into the red room. And you're like, well, wait, wait, wait a minute, Jesus. This is where my pride resides. This is where I've been flirting with a coworker for a while, or, or I've been so entitled I've been taking money, or, or this is where, uh, you know, whatever the sin is that you're struggling with currently, this is where it's at. And Jesus goes, it's okay, I'll take it. I'll help you clean it up. But so often we're like, no, 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 I, I, I don't want to do this. I don't want to bring that to the light because I'm ashamed, I'm embarrassed. If you really saw this, if you knew who I was, you would leave. There's no way I'm going to give you this room. Jesus, please go into the green room. Church, Jesus came to heal the broken. He didn't come to hang out with the healthy. He came to help the sick. And so what we have to learn to do is what this man did is when Jesus says, hey, show me your hand, and it's the thing that we're most ashamed of, we need to do it anyway. The scripture says, so the man held out his hand and it was restored. Hallelujah, right? This is where the crowd goes wild. People start saying hallelujah, come into faith. People repent. There's this whole revival that breaks out from this church moving outward, right? Everything's going on, or at least they, they all start to golf clap. But none of that happens. Right? You're like, right, I'm sure people were faced with their pride. They knew it. They acknowledged their hard hearts. Jesus started saving people. Nope. Mark says this is the next thing that happens. At once the Pharisees went away and met with the supporters of Herod to plot how to kill Jesus. The next thing. He heals. It's amazing. They don't see it. They go out and start to plot. Now let me pause. Where do you find yourself? If you were sitting in that church, where would you be? Right? I'm sure you'd be like, dude, I, I would have got up and cheered and told those, all those religious Peter, people to get on board. I, I would have cheered Jesus and booed the religious people. I would be on the good guy's side. But Jesus' version of religion is very uncomfortable. And you're probably like, Rod, if it were me, I, I would get it. Right? And so often we do this. We read the Bible and we classify people into two sections. There's the villains and the heroes. 
right? And I want you to think about this because this is our life. Every story since the beginning of time has two things, a villain and a hero. Every movie you watch, where it's a Marvel movie or anything, right, that has to have two things, has to have a villain and a hero, and we love to hate the villain. We love to see them get their due, and we love to identify with the heroes. That would be me. Of course, I would always do the right thing. I would stand up for the right way. And church, if you read the Bible I read, here's what I want you to know. Everybody's a villain, and Jesus is the hero. There's a line, and there's everybody, and then there's Jesus. And that's how it works. We're so broken that we couldn't come to God on our own. If we could, he wouldn't need to come. And so because of what he did on the cross, we get to identify with him, but don't pretend that you would be there if Jesus came on the scene and he preached this hard message and that you would be on his side. You probably would be on the side of the religious people because Jesus's religion removes our control. And I said from the beginning, we love to be in control. We want to construct, uh, we want a construct that allows us to set the standard. I want you to think of it this way. We all want a religion where we can treat people how we want to, then have a conversation with God and he'll forgive us and we say we're sorry, then he forgets what we've done and we go on with our lives. We want to judge and classify people and then treat them along our own judgment and classifications and then get forgiven from God and move on. Let me put it behind you on the screen so you get what I'm saying. We want a faith that makes us accountable for how we treat God, not other people. Right? And church, uh, what's fascinating is this right here is paganism. It's not Christianity. Now, the world we live in and every other religion goes by this set of standards except Christianity. Now, what does paganism look like? Well, here's what it looks like. In paganism, there's either one god or there's many gods a lot of times, and they don't really like humans. They created them, but they they don't really like them. They don't like humanity. So humanity has to bribe or worship the gods to make them feel okay. They have to do behaviors. They make sacrifices. They they come to idols. And because if they don't do that, the crops don't grow. They don't get to bear children, and they're poor. But here's the rub that we don't always talk about. If the God or gods that they worship don't really care for humans, then you don't have to either. It doesn't really matter, right? And paganism creeps into every religion. We only care about pleasing God. We don't care about other people. And when we as Christians believe that we only have to make God happy through ritual prayers or attending church every week or self-sacrifice and how we treat others doesn't matter— We are fooling ourselves. Now, many times we look at this and go, man, that's legalism, but it's really kind of paganism creeping into Christianity in disguise. Because Jesus teaches the opposite. And time and time again, what made Jesus angry were when people used the law of God to discount people made in the image of God. Jesus always reminded them, you're on the wrong side of God. Don't kid yourself. Jesus didn't get angry when he didn't get his way. He got angry when religion got in God's way. What kind of religion frustrates God? What kind of religion got Jesus angry? Here it is. Religion that values God but ignores what God values. Religion that values God and ignores what God values. Religion that honors God but dishonors other people. And we've all done this. We fall into this trap. I'm one of them. We've practiced a religion that prioritizes God over what God prioritizes. If you've ever had a bad church experience, this may have been the cause. You watch godly people who are supposed to be godly treat others poorly and they don't really care. They just go to church and they're absolved of their sins and you're like, what is going on? Think about it this way. If I had a good friend who dishonored my kids, would I be happy with them? Let me take it one step further. Somebody I love dearly, if my parents treated my kids poorly, I would not be happy with my parents. 
I, my guess is it's you too. You have a, a friend and your friend comes over and goes, listen, I love you and you're awesome, but I hate your kids. You'd be like, it's time to leave my house. Before this, I say words I shouldn't, and then I have to ask for forgiveness, right? No matter what, we don't love people who treat the people we love poorly. And the same is true with God. Jesus comes and teaches his disciples one main lesson. The same one he wants you to learn today. Here's the quote I want you to remember. I broke it down to three words so you could figure this out. Right here it is. Come, follow me. Jesus. You don't have to worry about an address. Here it is. Come, follow me. And Jesus said it. Follow my example. Follow my teaching. Follow my sacrifice. So let me tell you the rest of the story real quick. Maybe you know it, maybe you don't. The religious leaders finally capture Jesus, right? They have him tried, and they ultimately put him on a cross, and, and he gets crucified. He dies on a cross. But they had no way of knowing that his crucifixion would be the ultimate example of what they hated, this annoying habit he had, the thing that drove them crazy of Jesus always giving himself away. Now, we know through church history that many Pharisees came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior after his death and resurrection. Many of the Pharisees that had him tried came to know Jesus. And I bet they looked back and thought, how could I have missed it? He made it so clear. It is so obvious now that I see back to what was going on. Church, this is why we exist, to do what Jesus did. We want to do corporately what we're called to do individually and what Jesus did habitually, which is give ourselves away. When we start talking about how to be rich, this is what we're talking about. Now let's go back to that scripture one more time, 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 18. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. The first line is written to us. Teach those who are rich. Church, you all are rich. By world standard, you're the rich of the rich. You're richy rich. If you know the old Scrooge McDuck diving in your gold, that's how you should feel. Have you ever gone on vacation? Oh my goodness, that makes you rich. Have you ever traveled anywhere? Just traveling makes you rich, which is the most funny thing. We go to Cambodia, just the fact that we can get to Cambodia makes us rich. Like we show up in Cambodia and we're preaching and teaching to all of these people. We're the rich ones. And funny thing is, rich people don't think they're rich. When you're having financial issues, I want you to do this. Imagine I'm sitting down with somebody who lives in the slums of Cambodia or Mexico or somewhere else and explaining your financial problems to. Well, you see, my 401k is down. Um, I didn't save enough this month. My bank account. Bank, just the fact that you have extra money at the end of the day makes you rich. You have rich people problems. Retirement? It's not a concept for 99% of the world's population. You have rich people problems. Now, there was a hashtag a few years back that was trending called uh, first world problems. But I like to make it a little personal, say it's rich people problems. Turn to the person next to you and say, I have rich people problems. Yeah, yeah nobody likes saying that out loud. Well, let me show you what a rich people problem is right here. My house is too big for my Wi-Fi signal. Here's another one I love. I'm hungry, but I already brushed my teeth. And how about the ultimate rich people problem right here? I can't hear the TV when I'm eating potato chips. Right? I'm just saying. Too few vacation days, rich people's problems. Slow internet. Rich people's problems. Power goes out last night. I'm frustrated because I have to walk up my stairs to get the extra iPhone battery so I can watch 
Netflix on my phone in the dark and I'm irritated the power goes out. Rich people problems. Getting added to a group text. I hate it. One person says something, everybody else has to like it. I got 52. Rich people problems, right? My life is pretty good. Long security light at airports. More expensive to fill up your SUV. Rich people problems. Church, we have to change the way we look at things. Start to realize that we have more than most. Here's a clue. If your problem starts with my pool guy, my landscaper, my car, my house, you have rich people problems. If you make over $50,000 a year, you're on the top 1% of the richest people in the world. Nobody's jumping up. Nobody's saying, hallelujah, Rod, thank you for changing my mind. Awesome, I'm so glad I can relax. I have rich people's problems. I never knew I was rich. Nobody's getting excited, screaming hallelujah. It's because we don't feel rich. If we're honest, we don't feel rich. Let's get back to scripture. Same scripture. This is the NIV version, and I love it because it's in 1 Timothy. It says, command those who are rich, right? This is for you and I. A pastor is supposed to command those who are rich. We're commanding you. What do we command? Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Don't forget he's talking about you. Now, why do I land on this so hard? A, because it's fun to make fun of ourselves. Two, we like to self-select ourselves out. Command those who are being rich. He's not talking to me. He's talking to the guy next to me. Right? Oh, oh, the church needs something. The church needs the lights on. We need to make sure we're being generous. Well, I'm not me because I'm not rich, but that guy two, two steps down, that's his job to care for the church. No, this is you. We are all rich. Right? If you have a car, you're rich. Some of you have cars that have houses on them, and you drive them around the country to vacation. <laughs> you're rich. And I love verse 18, to do good and to be rich. So here, if you don't know where this comes from, it's in the New Testament. Paul, who was this pastor who went around the country as a disciple, planting churches. Many of you, if you're in Glendale, think Tim Agnello, right? We sent Tim Agnello to, to be down at this church and care for it. And, and so he's a starter. And he, so Paul was this guy who started all these churches. And, and then he would put pastors down there. And so Timothy was a young guy, this very young pastor that, that he's caring for. So he writes two letters that we get to read in Scripture. We call them 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. But they're letters to care so, so that this pastor will know what to do. And he starts the letter. The first letter is talk to the rich people. This is before the importance of Scripture. Heresy preached in the church, God, uh, before godly behavior, before gossip, because that's all in his second letter. And so if he wrote this in his first letter, it's probably really important that we really want to pay attention. And I think he did this because it's a common struggle for us all. We all struggle with this one word, generosity. We all struggle being generous. But generosity can open hearts faster than theology. It should be the hallmark of Jesus followers. I would love it if people would say this about Christians. Listen, Rod, I don't really want to be a Christian, but I want to hire one. I want to know one. I want to work for one. In fact, I want my daughter to marry one because they're the most heartfelt, generous people we know. And if this isn't how the world sees us, church, we need to work on that. We got to be better at being rich. Because this was the hallmark of the early church. It's hard to imagine, but the early church had nothing. No building, no voice. They couldn't get work because people thought they were a cult. They were persecuted. They were fed to lions. They were killed. But the things that set early Christianity apart was generosity. It wasn't theology. In fact, the theology was too hard for them to understand, right? You had the, can the Jews do it or the Gentiles? And it's this mix of thing and anybody can come to Jesus. We don't get that. So it wasn't theology. It was no strings generosity. That changed hearts. They had nothing but they gave. They were compassionate to a fault. They loved well. Jesus taught them to love your neighbor, and he redefined neighbor. He said, anybody you come in contact with, even those Sumerians, right, the people who don't look like you, sound like you, think like you, those are your neighbors. 
And then on the night he died, he, he said, if you ever find yourself with power, influence, prestige, your job is to wield it for the powerless, those who are the least of society. And then he showed them through his actions. And then he gave them this one instruction. Come, follow me. So how do we do this? Well, we do this by loving God and loving those who, who God loves. Right? We do this by doing good deeds and being generous. Church, this is why we ask people who call Mosaic home to, to give to the mission and vision of Mosaic. We want to th- love those who God loves. Because we want to share the good news. We believe that the gospel is the best news ever known to man. We want to be here when people have questions. We want to be equipped to help one another out when needed. We want to respond well to felt needs in the community. And if we're all generous, we can do this well. Think about it this way. When Mannion Middle School last year called and said, we are empty in our food and our clothing pantry, you guys jumped in and helped because you were generous. Think about it this way, Glendale. If Park Meadows Elementary or Deer Valley Middle School calls you, we want you to be prepared to meet those needs. And I believe if we are generous people, we will look like Jesus. And it's hard to do that alone, right? If you're just on a mountaintop somewhere, you and Jesus, and that's your church, and you look out, you go, man, there's so many heartfelt needs. The community needs stuff. People overseas need stuff. There's no way I can meet all these needs. But if we pool our resources and we're generous, we will be like the early church. Now, the first century church grabbed a hold of this. And it changed everything about who they were. When plagues ripped through the area in the first and second and third centuries, everyone fled except for Christians. They stayed and nursed people back to health. Many lost their lives in this selfless act. And the pagans, they were the first to leave because they had the means. They were the wealthiest. They left. And when they returned, many people abandoned paganist beliefs and became Christians. Not because of beliefs or theology, not because of miracles, but because of their generosity. So Diane and I, in our early years, were broke. And I mean broke. We were still rich by world standards, but we were struggling. Diane got pregnant with Lucy and couldn't work for a while. I changed jobs. It was just, it was one of those really difficult times. Diane changed jobs after Lucy was about 18 months old. We were still struggling. She went to work at this Montessori school. And there was this very kind lady there. And they had this really funny relationship. We weren't Christians by any stretch of the imagination. And this gal was a Christ follower at her work. And so Diane would ask her questions. And she wouldn't know how to respond. So she would write them all down. And she would go home and talk to her husband. And then she'd come home the next day and go, okay, here's the answers I have. And then Diane would ask, well, what, why can't we read horoscopes? Why, like, what's the big deal of that? I don't get that. And she'd write it all down and she'd go home and then she'd come back. And, and this happened for months and months and months of just loving on Diane who, uh, and you know, and then Diane would come home and tell me and I would say, well, ask this question. And then Diane would go, so it's just this really thing, right? So we were all kind of arguing. Well, we found ourselves in November, laid off and couldn't afford a dime, couldn't afford a Christmas for our kids. So this gal rallies the people at work, rallies support, And what they did was they came around us and adopted us and gave us gifts for our kids, gave Diane and I a gift. They provided a Christmas for us. And it was so significant. Not the fact of what we believed and not the arguing back and forth on theology, but that somebody would go out of their way to be generous. Now, it wasn't because of that that we came to Christ six months later. But that was a factor in our minds of these people are different. No strings generosity is one of the main reasons Christianity has spread all over the globe today. No strings generosity is still a way that captures people's hearts. The best example of who we are is unprecedented generosity. Loving the people that God loves. But daily generosity is difficult if we're honest. 
Because we value our time, I treasure my possessions, and I covet my wealth. But the antidote to this is generosity. Being selfless with our time. Being open-handed with our possessions. You need something, you're free to have it. And then, you know what we do? We stop there. We go, that's enough. I'll give you my time and my possessions, but don't talk about my money. Don't talk about my wealth. Church, we need to be generous with everything we have. And if we're honest, the church cannot be generous if we are not generous. So here's my challenge. Even if you're not rich, even if you're struggling with generosity, I want you to give something to be generous over the next 90 days. Over the next 90 days, I want to challenge you to be generous. If you've been coming for a while to Mosaic and you're giving nothing, try $50 a week. If you give $50 a week, try $100 a week. If you give 2%, try 3%. And if you're one of those people that is very blessed and you give 10% and you're like, that's enough. I don't really have to be generous. It's very easy. I give 10%. That's not a generous heart. Try 15%. And it's not the same amount. It's the same sacrifice. I want you to hear that, right? And we say this, we don't want something from you. We want something for you. I want your hearts to be aligned in generosity. I want you to feel rich. I want you, as Paul would say, I want you to be really good at being rich. Because if we do this, we're going to be such a great witness. Join us, church, in our mission at Mosaic at being good at being rich. Serve with us here right here and in our schools. Open up your home or go to a home group. Also, give with us. Take this 90-day challenge to give something and be generous. And join us as we show the world unconventional, unbridled, crazy generosity. Because if we do this, we will love people who God loves and we'll be able to be better at being rich. Let's pray.